Hello and welcome back to a brand new version of 12 Days in March. In our first series, we'll be using a question-based format to assess the swollen joint. I will remind you that these videos are designed to be viewed sequentially as we build your USMLE portfolio. And here is an initial reminder. Please pause the recordings to answer the questions. This will be followed by a question review focusing on STEM interpretation and a thoughtful review of answer options. Even if you know the answer, I'd advise you to stick with the discussion as it will highlight features beyond the response alone. We'll next review content in the context of diagnostic algorithms, and at the conclusion, I'll present the summary Word document for your note-keeping purposes. And with that background, we are ready to launch our review of the swollen joint. This presentation has five questions built around a single case presentation. Good luck. Here is question one. And question two, which is the same as question one, without the graphic. And a question on pathogenesis. And a question on treatment. And here is our last question. All right, here goes. As with all questions, we eyeball the lead-in sentence first to get a sense of what they want from our lives. In this vignette, they want the most likely diagnosis, and I'll quickly eyeball the choices. Before getting to the vignette, let's eyeball the graphic to assist in interpreting the vignette. My rule of thumb is this. If you can make a diagnosis from the graphic, bully for you. But that's not usually the case. So here, I see swollen, nodular, or enlarged PIP joints. These could be TOFI, osteoarthritis, or perhaps rheumatoid nodules, but it isn't a slam dunk, so let's move on to the vignette. We have an elderly patient with pain and shoulder stiffness. Then they offer the modifier that it is long-standing and perhaps related to an MVA from her distant past. We'll keep this in the back of our minds. She's on a statin, and we know that statins can be associated with muscle pain, but it doesn't really fit the story. And statin-associated myopathy is not an answer option, so we can marginalize this information. Next, they offer normal vital signs. And here we pull in a key dogma from the 12 Days video series. Data is more important than physical exam, which is more important than verbiage. For data and physical exam, the findings may be described as normal or abnormal. So when they offer normal vital signs, it is the NBME's way of telling us that infection is unlikely and we are probably not dealing with a constitutional illness such as RA or PMR. I understand this is a leap of faith, but I do want you to pay attention to negative findings. The examination continues describing decreased range of motion with crepitus, which is a classic description for osteoarthritis. There is no warmth or erythema, but an effusion is appreciated. No warmth or erythema suggests the absence of inflammation, but an effusion informs us there is a joint injury. And here the vignette describes what we've already seen in the graphic, nodularity of the PIPs. It is noteworthy that they show us a hand graphic in a patient with shoulder pain. We'll come back to this point later. But ding, 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 here is the money, abnormal data. For teaching purposes, I've included an x-ray of the hip to highlight the findings. These include hypertrophic bone spurs, more commonly referred to as osteophytes. Narrowing of the joint space is noted, and this is classic for osteoarthritis. And finally, a subchondral cyst is described with bony sclerosis. So let's pause for a moment and reflect. Regardless of the information included in the stem, this data essentially confirms the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. So let's label this as a graphic you need to know. The radiograph also underscores my points raised in the introductory video. On step one, you need to be familiar with the radiograph as it reflects the underlying pathogenesis, the mechanical failure of articular cartilage. But on step two, the failure of articular cartilage generates a diagnostic radiograph. On both step one and step two, the radiograph will appear. The only difference will be the nature of the derivatives. All right, let's move this one along and put it to rest. The last part of the question stem includes negative data detailing a low ESR and normal muscle enzyme. When the NBME offers negative data, it is their way of excluding diseases from the differential diagnosis. Pay attention to negative data. It matters. On that note, it is safe to say that this patient does not have PMR. So coming back to the original question stem, let's review what we do have. 
an elderly patient with joint pain and stiffness. We have an exam that is consistent with osteoarthritis and a definitive radiograph. All these features support the correct answer, osteoarthritis. To review the graphic, it reveals Bouchard's nodes, which are also consistent with the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. And returning to the information about the motor vehicle accident, the question writer was informing us why she has osteoarthritis in the shoulder, as in post-traumatic OA, which is the most common secondary cause of osteoarthritis, but there are other causes, including hyperparathyroidism and hemochromatosis, among the more commonly mentioned. And finally, before finishing a question, make sure you understand the key take-homes. As for rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis, stiffness will be the major overlapping feature. Rheumatoid arthritis, of course, has protracted stiffness with other signs and symptoms of a systemic inflammatory condition involving many joints. This patient had no other feature of rheumatoid arthritis, so in spite of the stiffness, RA was never a serious consideration. Adhesive capsulitis will be discussed in our orthopedics section, but this case was replete with definitive features of osteoarthritis, making adhesive capsulitis a less likely cause. PMR was readily excluded by the normal ESR, and finally, the graphic was included to make the student ponder the fifth choice, tophaceous gout. This was excluded by the lack of any features of gout. So with this background, we can work our way through the other typical osteoarthritis derivatives you'll need to know for the boards. In this question, we're moving on to our algorithmic approach to the swollen joint. That said, synovial fluid analysis will be a key branch point for joint disorders on the USMLE, and in fact, really makes our job easy. So these are the categories that should come immediately to mind when a vignette describes a joint effusion. The categories include non-inflammatory, inflammatory, and pyogenic, which are, in turn, defined by the synovial fluid analysis. This is a must-know. And we're going to keep the synovial fluid interpretation real simple. I've included normal values as a reference. So what should you pay attention to? Not the color and clarity. Charts always include this information, and I don't want to be a nihilist, but you won't make a diagnosis based on the color and clarity, other than perhaps for a hemarthrosis, as in hemophilia. These are the numbers I want you to focus on. Cell count, and more importantly, the percentage of PMNs. These are the major values to be familiar with on the boards. As you can see, non-inflammatory conditions have less than 2,000 WBCs, and there should only be a low percentage of PMNs. Inflammatory disorders have a wide range of WBCs, from the thousands into the tens of thousands. That's why I simply list the number as greater than 2,000, but pay attention to the percentage of PMNs. Less than 75%. That's the magic number. Percent of PMNs. The last category is pyogenic infections. The number of WBCs can show significant overlap with inflammatory conditions. After all, isn't a pyogenic infection an inflammatory condition? So the pyogenic category will be distinguished again by the percentage of PMNs, usually in the 90% range. And although you'll see charts with varying values, this breakdown will work very well on the boards. Then you're like, Sachs, what do these categories, non-inflammatory, inflammatory, pyogenic, mean? Well, here it is. The non-inflammatory synovial fluid analysis is the language of osteoarthritis. Inflammatory fluid is further categorized by the presence or absence of crystals, and the pyogenic category will be distinguished by gram stain characteristics. We'll be coming back to this algorithm repeatedly in the exercises which follow, and of course, the synovial fluid analysis will be part of the larger picture as suggested by history, physical exam, other lab features, and radiographs. So please be familiar with synovial fluid categories. You can't get the derivatives unless you make the diagnosis. So coming back to our case of osteoarthritis, the correct answer was B. Osteoarthritis is the prototypic non-inflammatory joint effusion. Moving along, this is a straightforward derivative based on the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis. And yes, it is a step one derivative, but we've seen how pathogenesis of a condition explains the pathology you need to be familiar with on step two. And just to be clear, here is osteoarthritis in a nutshell. That loss of articular cartilage exposes the subchondral bone, which then becomes the new articular surface. All the radiographic findings reflect changes to that subchondral surface. 
No topic is complete without a little pharmacology fun. This is a straightforward question confused mostly by the fact that students don't believe that acetaminophen is a treatment for anything on the boards. To be sure, it is a second order question dependent on you making the correct diagnosis. Once you make the diagnosis, acetaminophen is the only answer that makes sense. And I must say, students see what they want to see. That is, they see methotrexate in the answer choice and then start working backward. They rifle through the stem looking for information to support their erroneous theories. They see pain and stiffness with nodularity and decide the patient has RA, ignoring the key and definitive data. Unfortunately, that's not how the game is played. We work from the stem down. Working from the options back to the stem is always dangerous and tricky business. And the final derivative I want to raise with this exercise, which is step two fodder, is the issue of secondary etiologies for osteoarthritis. There aren't many, but you should be on the lookout. Let's quickly peruse this table. Insofar as choice A, there is no consideration of hypocalcemia and osteoarthritis, so we can skip that one. Choice C might suggest the diagnosis of renal osteodystrophy if and when the GFR is less than 15. This entity is discussed elsewhere, but is not associated with osteoarthritis per se. Choice D reveals hyperuricemia, which may be associated with gout or crystalline arthropathy. The chronic form causes erosive arthritis, not osteoarthritis. And choice E lists an elevated ceruloplasmin. Just as a reminder, ceruloplasmin is an acute phase reactant and may be elevated in any systemic inflammatory condition. Wilson's disease, on the other hand, is associated with an arthropathy, but is diagnosed with a low ceruloplasmin, not an elevated value. Which brings us to our correct answer, choice B, the elevated ferritin. Hemochromatosis is associated with an osteoarthritis, like arthropathy, principally mediated through its association with CPPD, and that will be further discussed in subsequent videos. This is relatively low yield material, but does represent right fodder for the NBME. So here is a summary of the teaching points covered in this presentation, including the clinical and diagnostic feature. We applied disease pathogenesis to our understanding of the radiographic findings, we highlighted symptomatic treatment and suggested that degenerative joint disease is the final common pathway for a number of disorders. We also introduced synovial fluid analysis as a key branch point in the evaluation of the swollen joint and applied those findings to our diagnostic algorithm intended to help you organize and categorize disorders that present with joint swelling. We'll be returning to this algorithm repeatedly throughout this section. And finally, I leave you with this written summary of osteoarthritis for the USMLA. The Word document is available for download at the 12 Days website. As mentioned in the introductory video, feel free to use this when reviewing and refining your notes. So I will slowly scroll through the summary for those of you who aren't heading over to the website. And then I'll do it. Case 1 on osteoarthritis is in the books. As we are at the beginning of the Step 2 series, this is the time to offer feedback. Please send your comments, good or bad, to Howard at 12 Days. Any and all constructive feedback will be well received. Many thanks and best of luck with your studies.